praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for allowing us to be here. We pick up in our study of the book of John, from John chapter 6, where we left off last week, John chapter 6. And we will pick up from verse um, 30, 38, from verse 38, John chapter 6. We bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your love, your mercies, your faithfulness, your compassion towards us. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of our sins. God, we thank you for life. Lord, even as we gather today in the sanctuary, let your presence fill this place, Lord. Bless us with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Give us pure hearts. Lord, we pray for clean hands and pure hearts as we come into the sanctuary today. Let the Holy Spirit take control of whatever is going to be said and done today in your house, we pray. In Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So we pick it up from verse uh, 38 from John chapter 6. Um, it said, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, last week we, we touched on a lot of different um, topics, a lot of different things that we talked about last week. We talked about um, uh, if one save and always save uh, eternal security. Um, we also talked about the sovereignty of God in salvation. And also we spoke about human responsibility. So we, we didn't get far last week, but I think we covered a whole lot by talking about these things. And I hope as we discuss these things, we are gaining uh, more understanding of what the Word of God said about these subjects. So in, in verse 38, uh, Jesus continued to speak to the Jewish people. He said, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now all day yesterday, I was going over this part of the text, where Jesus declared that he came down from heaven. The Jewish people, when Jesus said that to them, they didn't understand what he was talking about. They totally um, get upset. They start murmuring and they, they become real upset and real angry because Jesus said he came down from heaven. And I was given this uh, part of the text some uh, serious consideration to try to understand what the Lord was saying here. He says, for I came down from heaven. And uh, we have to understand, when Jesus said he came down from heaven, I personally, literally take this to mean that Jesus literally came down from heaven. And uh, when we, it, those of us who took it to mean that Jesus literally came down from heaven, we must be able to reconcile that with uh, his um, conception or the virgin birth, how he was conceived by the Virgin Mary. And because he being conceived by, by uh, the Virgin Mary, even though we call it, uh, the, the, you know, it's a conception that was miraculously performed by the Holy Spirit, Jesus' birth, the birth of Jesus was a natural birth. It wasn't a spiritual birth. Jesus, when Jesus was born as a baby, it wasn't a spiritual birth. It was a natural birth. But it's just that the conception of uh, him, him being conceived in the womb of uh, Mary, it wasn't a, a natural conception as ordinary human being. It was done by the Holy Spirit. So my point is, how do we reconcile what Jesus said that he came down from heaven? Should we take this as a figurative language? Or should we take this as he is literally saying that he came down from heaven? And uh, if Jesus came down from heaven, how do we explain that? How do we explain that he came down from heaven? Did he come down uh, as a big person? Did he come down as a baby? How did it really happen? Because there's a lot of people um, today who doubt that Jesus literally came down from heaven. And uh, when they bring up these points and they try to explain that uh, the Gospel of John is considered to be a spiritual gospel. And it is not really talking about things that literally took place. So we should not take these things literally. 
and they will try to, um, you know, deny the um, pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is a this is a, a, a part of Scripture that we as born again believers we need to get an understanding of what the Lord is saying. And I don't know how you guys view this text, but when Jesus said He came down from heaven, I literally believe that Jesus was in heaven. He pre-existed in heaven. And he came down from heaven, um, physically came down from heaven, and he was conceived, the Holy Spirit, um, by the power of God, allowed his conception to take place um, with the Virgin Mary. And uh, the Spirit of God planted that uh, baby into the womb of the Virgin Mary, and the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ took place. But physically, uh, in a literal sense, I believe that the Lord literally came down from heaven. And uh, just like how uh, Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, it wasn't a spiritual thing. Jesus, when he was taken up to heaven, it wasn't a spiritual thing that happened. He physically was taken up into heaven. And uh, uh, some people will say, well, the Bible never explained to us and the Bible never gave us any evidence to show that Jesus came down from heaven. But there are some things that God chose not to disclose to us. The Bible tells us that the, the, the things that are revealed in the Bible has been given to us by God so that we could understand them. And there are things that are not revealed, that is not disclosed, or the secret things of God. God kept some things secret for himself. And uh, maybe this is one of the the thing that we don't really have the full understanding about. So we, we continue where Jesus said, For I came down from heaven. And as I said, I believe it, he's not uh, speaking in figurative um, language. Yeah, go ahead. If, I, just, I might just run back to um, Abraham and Sarah. Mm -hmm. Sarah couldn't have children. Abraham had, I think he's about 80 something years at that time. Mm -hmm. And his wife was, as the Bible, we all know this whole story about uh, Sarah. Right. And she had, she got pregnant. Here God spoke to, um, it was um, this prophet, I think it was Jeremiah. He said, sit before I form you in your mother's womb. Right. You know. I know you. I right. knew you. You will be this and be that. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to believe that the same thing with Christ there, or with, uh, with Christ, because he said that Christ is from, um, is Divine origin, straight mm -hmm. from heaven. Right. It's divine origin. So the, the whole the whole length of the scripture with Abraham and, and Jeremiah, it also have kind of similar meaning. Well, I understand that, but the, the thing is, what the people in Jesus' time was arguing is that how can he say he came down from heaven when they knew his parents? He was born as a, 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 a as a man, as a human person, and uh, it's the same thing today. We have people. We have uh, suppose. Christian people who say they believe the Bible, but they don't literally believe that Jesus came down from heaven. They believe that he was born, but they don't believe in his pre-existence. In other words, what they're saying is that um, the beginning, Jesus' beginning took place at his birth, at his physical birth. There was no, um, he, he didn't um, pre-exist. And uh, so they try to tell you, well, he wasn't um, pre-existing in heaven. And if he wasn't pre-existing in heaven, it means that uh, he cannot be God. Because, um, you know, the birth of Jesus Christ um, took place, you know, just over 2,000 years ago. And uh, for somebody to claim to be God and they just came into existence 2,000 years ago, it doesn't really add up. So when they, they, they try to put doubt... Um, on this part of the text and try to tell us that we should not believe that Jesus um, literally is saying that he came down from heaven and he was living in heaven. And uh, if we have to go along and say, well, you know, they, what they're saying makes sense because if he was born as a baby, how can he say he came down from heaven? So that's what I'm saying. The coming down from heaven, the only way we can explain it is is how the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that um, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And uh, him being conceived by the Holy Spirit 
I am taking that literally to mean that the Holy Spirit, He is the one that um, planted that, uh, the, the, the Son of God in the form of that baby in the womb of uh, the Virgin Mary. And uh, that didn't, uh, the, the, uh, the, no human being had anything to do with that. Joseph didn't have anything to do with the conception of um, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Mary was just a carrier. She was just a carrier of, um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, herself and Joseph didn't have any, there was no human uh, connection. He was not born by blood or after the will of man. So we have to, those of us who are born again, believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we face people who want to tell us that Jesus uh, didn't come, come down from heaven, it's figurative language, and it's in a spiritual sense they're talking about, we have to be on our guard to safeguard ourselves against these things. So when he said that he came down from heaven, he is literally saying that he was existing in heaven before his birth. And he came down from heaven. Praise the Lord. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So he came with a purpose, and his purpose was to fulfill the will of his father, the, the will of him that sent him. And verse 39 said, And this is the father's will which had sent me, that of all which he had given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up at the last day. So last week, uh, Sister Lois asked about um, eternal, the question about eternal security. If once a person saved, if that, if that person can lose their salvation. And uh, when we really look at that, we have to really say yes or no. You know, to the, the answer to that question is yes and no. Because um, no, in a sense, when a person really fully, sincerely commit their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that person eternally is saved. And uh, that person will make mistakes, they will maybe fall, they will stumble, they will get themselves into sin from time to time, but the thing is, they're not going to stay in that condition. They're going to pick themselves up and they're going to move on. And once you become born again, and you make, you, you resolve in your spirit that you are going to serve God for the rest of your life, no devil can really change your mind. It is up to you as an individual to really change your mind. So, uh, in, in terms of a person losing their salvation, I would say no, no in the sense that if you truly born again and you make a commitment, you make that resolve that you're going to serve God for the rest of your life, that's what, about what comes in your life, you're going to continue to serve the Lord. Yes, you're going to make it to eternity. And you're going to make it uh, into heaven as a saved person. God is going to, by, by His grace, He will give you the strength and the endurance that you could make it. But... Um, Yes, in the sense that if somebody thinks that they can just say they receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and then continue for a short time and then decide to go back into the world and figure that, you know, they will be sealed for eternity and they don't need to um, reconcile to the Lord and everything is going to be okay, I would say, yes, that person is going to lose their salvation. Because according to what the Bible tells us that um, no unrighteousness, um, can enter into God's kingdom. But those of us who truly trust the Lord and uh, commit our life into God's hand, we are going to make it. We are going to, uh, as Jesus uh, promised his disciples when he entered into that ship and he said to them, um, you know, go to the other side. You know, in spite of the fact that the storm arose and the wind become boisterous, they are going to, they make it to the other side. And it's the same thing, those of us who are born again, in the life that we are living today, we are going to meet with testing, trials, difficulty. Sometimes we might fall, we make mistakes, we mess up our lives. But the thing is, once you have that genuine desire within your heart that you are going to make it and you're going to serve the Lord for the rest of your life, I will say for sure you're going to make it. You're going to make it um, into heaven. But for those who decide that once they have salvation, they decide they want to go back and mingle again in sin, I'll say, you know, God is not going to allow um, a lifestyle like that to enter into, into his kingdom. So uh, the, in the verse that we are talking about in verse 39, 
And this is the, the Father's will which hath sent me. He's talking about the will of the Father that sent him. That of all which he has given me. He's talking about collectively as a group. That all that which he have, uh, have given me, should, I shall lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And you know, as I study this part of the text, I ask myself the question, when the Lord talk about all that God the Father have given him, he is going to lose nothing. I was wondering if the text where the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I was asking myself the question, if the whosoever can fit into this part of, uh, of verse 39, when he talks about um, uh, those that the Father have given him, he will lose nothing. And, uh, you know, if, when you look at this text, I, you know, I'm asking myself the question, if God have a, a special group of people, is there a special group of people? Is there somebody, um, pardon? Partial. Right, but that's all I'm trying to get out. Is there a special group of people? Is there somebody with a name? Is there persons with name in this part of the group that the Lord is talking about here? He said, and this is the Father's will which he had, uh, 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 which has sent me, that of all which he had given me, I should lose nothing. So this is, he's talking about collectively. It's a group. But is there special people or people with names, somebody uh, individual uh, uh, in the sense that special people that is chosen by the Lord who make up this part of the group? This is the question that, um, you know, we have to um, reconcile. And uh, Jesus is saying that from that group of people, he is going to lose nothing. So my, my question is, is, can the whosoever that John 3.16 talk about, can that fit in that group? Is this group also talking about whosoever, or this group talking about a special group of people that will make it into, the, into heaven, that is sealed from eternity past, and uh, that doesn't have to make any effort. They are chosen by God before the foundation of the world, and there's a text that we're going to come to um, um, later, later on here, that talks about the Lord drawing those that he wants to come to him. And a lot of people explain that to mean that there is no um, action that is necessary on the part of the person who God chose or who God wants to draw to, to, to them. So he said that uh, those people that uh, the Father gave or the group of people that the Lord gave to him, the Father gave to him, he is going to lose nothing. Praise the Lord. And that's why I was saying a while ago that if you um, commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that God is going to say, take us safely into eternity and uh, we will make it into heaven. And he said, but shall raise it up at the last day. So not even death can really separate us from Almighty God. Not even death can cancel out our salvation. You know, the Bible talks about what shall separate us from the love of God, tribulation, uh, he talks about uh, pr prostitution, he talks about um, angels, he talks about death, and all of these things. There is nothing that can separate the believer from the love of God or from, uh, you know, salvation. Praise the name of the Lord. Once you fully um, devote and commit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, not even the devil can uh, take you from out of his hand. Jesus asked the question, he said, that uh, when a person is in the Father's hand, nobody can pluck them out of uh, his hand. But nobody plucking you or pulling you out of God's hand, and you release yourself from out of God's hand, is it, two different things. You know, because God, we are not robots. And uh, God don't want to, He don't want us to serve Him because He forced us to serve Him. We have to serve Him willingly. Amen. It, it had to be a spontaneous love from us to him. Uh, in verse 40, he said, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him 
may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So he's saying here that everyone who sees the Son, and this is not really talking about physically, uh, there are some things or some verses that is figurative um, language, and some verses that, for instance, like the one that Jesus said he came down from heaven, we have to take that physically, but this one here is more or less figurative. He's not talking about seeing him physically, although some people did saw him physically. But when he talk here about seeing, he's talking about somebody who um, gays, somebody who have a relationship, having a relationship with the Son. When we, because uh, you remember with um, Philip and the Lord Jesus, when uh, he asked Jesus to show him the Father, and uh, Jesus said to Philip, Philip, you've been so long with me and you have not, have not seen the Father. And he said that he that seeth me have seen the Father. So when he talks here about seeing the Son, I believe he's talking about having a relationship, knowing him as your personal Savior. When we confess our sins to him and invite him to become the Lord and Master of our life, we enter into a, a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's seeing Him. We have a picture of Him in our spirit. And we get to know Him on a personal basis. And He, and he said, and believe it on Him. So it's not just to, to say you know Jesus, but you have to believe and you have to trust. And you have to commit your life to Him. He said, may have everlasting life. So there, there are steps that one has to take before they can have um, everlasting life. They have to trust the Lord. They have to have a relationship with Him. They have to confess their sins. Your life has to be changed. You have to acknowledge that you are a sinner in the sight of God, and then you turn from your unrighteousness. You know, uh, uh, it, the Bible tells us that repentance is the confession and the forsaking of sins. The turning of one from Satan unto God is literally turn around. Your life is turned around. And uh, in verse uh, 40, in the middle of the verse, it said, and believe it on Him, may have everlasting life. So when we do all those uh, things that is required of us, then we can say we are moving on to everlasting life. We, we have everlasting life. The Lord gave us that promise that everlasting life or eternal life, we will be the possessor of everlasting or eternal life. And uh, I will raise Him up at the last day. So this life is not going to be the end. There's a last day that is coming. The day of judgment, the day of resurrection. Praise the Lord. Verse uh, 41. Then the, uh, uh, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So just like how a lot of people today is questioning uh, this scripture, the Jewish people back in that time, they were marveling and they were um, murmuring about what Jesus said because Jesus is telling them that he came down from heaven, and as we will see in these verses, they will go on to say to him that uh, they know his father and his mother. They knew him growing up as a child, and uh, then he was telling them, uh, you know, that he came down from heaven. It's like one time he, he told them that before Abraham was, I am. And uh, when he told them before Abraham, uh, he was existing before Abraham, that also caused them to become upset. Because they said to him, you are not even 40 years yet, and you are saying that you were before Abraham. Praise the Lord. And uh, verse 42, and they said, is not this Jesus? So this is what they, they, they are question, uh, questioning him, or questioning themselves. Is not this Jesus, the person that we know, um, the son of Joseph? You know, so they consider him to be um, the physical son of Joseph whose father and mother we know, how is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? So how can you have a biological father and mother and you grow up in the village and some of these people, I guess, probably was a lot older than the Lord Jesus and he was telling them that he came down from heaven. They, what they were saying, they knew his beginning. They know where he came from and how can he say to them that uh, they came, he came down from heaven? And uh, this caused them to become angry with him because he more or less, uh, you know, when he said he came down from heaven, he was making himself equal to God. And he was talking about his pre-existence. 
And more or less they consider that to be blasphemy. He was blaspheming. Verse um, 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Mormon not among yourselves. So he knew that they were angry, he knew that they were confused, and they were um, upset about what he was saying. He said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So this is another verse that caused a lot of um, conversation in the, you know, the, the body of Christ today. The Calvinist is saying that for a person to come to God, God has to draw him. And for God drawing that person, meaning that that person, it doesn't require any action on the part of that individual. For a person to come to God, that person don't require to do nothing. God will draw that person, and that person is predestined and before the foundation of the world, and God in his own time is going to bring that person to know him, and that person don't have to, it don't require no action on the part of that person. Go ahead. It gives them security. Well, but you see, what, well, what, what, what they're saying, or what I'm trying to get to, is that they're saying that the drawing there means that the sinner was totally helpless, mm -hmm. and he was dead in his sin, and uh, he couldn't do anything, you know, to assist or to bring himself to the place where he can come to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And all of the doing was on God's part. Okay. And uh, the, 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 the sinner couldn't do anything. He was helpless, he was dead, and uh, he, he couldn't do anything. So God is the one that negotiated and did everything on the part of the sinner. God provides salvation, and God is the one that brings the sinner to him. And there was nothing required on the part of the sinner. Okay. And uh, what, it was, what they also said is that um, the sinner can't resist. <laughs> he can't resist. You know, God decided to draw him, mm -hmm. so he can't resist. You know, he's under comp compulsion, compulsion to come to the Lord. And, uh, you know, the Calvinists, that is how they um, really explain uh, these, these, these texts. Okay. You know, so that's the reason why I'm saying that we ourselves, we need to examine these texts for ourselves. And to, to, you know, when we measure other scriptures with them to see if it's really um, bearing out these things. You know, I believe that the Holy Spirit draws us to Him. But drawing and tugging or pulling is two different things. When, you, when, when, when it said the Holy Spirit draws, I believe it's talking about uh, in ties. Or it's like you quoting a woman and you trying to draw her by your words. You know, the way you treat her and stuff like that. It's the same way I think the Holy Spirit tries to... Um, entice people through the, the preaching of the gospel or the life of the believer. The Holy Spirit will try to entice people uh, to come, you know, to, to, to know God as their Lord and Savior. But He doesn't tug them. He doesn't pull them. Satan is the one who will try to pull you, you know, and tug you and drag you. But God is, He, he, he will try to draw you or entice you and show you uh, His goodness through um, the preaching of the gospel and through the, the lifestyle of, of his people. But it's not a, a drawing in the sense that you don't have any power to resist. You know, for a person to come to know God as Savior, they have to consciously make a decision that they're going to come to him. If you decide, you make a decision within your heart, I don't want to have nothing to do with God. I don't want to have nothing to do with the gospel. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to read the Bible. If you really make up your mind and that is your decision, God is going to respect that decision. He's going to honor that decision. Praise the Lord. All right, so uh, he, he said uh, in verse 44, No man uh, can come to me except the Father which had sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So as the Calvinists declared, it, they call it irresistible grace. And what he's saying is that the man or the person that is chosen by God, when God is ready to draw them, they cannot resist. And as I think about uh, what they are saying in terms of this text, if that is the case, that God has special people that he will choose to draw by his own doing, they don't have any 
kind of um, action, there's no action that is required on their behalf to come to know the Lord, then it, it kind of nullifies the preaching of the gospel. Why, why do we still have to preach if God will choose in his own time to draw the people that he wants to himself without any action on their behalf, then it's useless to preach the gospel. You know, that is the reason why we, we have been given the commission to, to preach the good news of salvation. The message of salvation is to bring people to the place where they will acknowledge their sins and uh, they will see the light and see their condition and they are able to make a, a step forward uh, to uh, acknowledge their sins, confessing their sin, and receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is not totally, you know, up to God. God is the one that provides salvation. But where the, the decision to accept salvation, the individual person have a part to play in that. They have a part to play. Praise the Lord. All right, so um, in verse 45, he said, uh, it is written in the prophet. He taught Jesus talking about Old Testament scriptures. And uh, they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that had heard and had learned of the Father cometh unto me. So I, I think this verse here kind of give us uh, some clarification. It said, and it is written in the prophets, meaning in the Old Testament scripture, and they shall be all taught of God. When, when you are taught or when somebody teach, the student uh, mind, their intellect come into focus. Their intellect, have to, they, have to, they have to give attention to what is being communicated. They have to give themselves to what is being communicated. And that is an action on the part of that individual. And Jesus is quoting here and saying that um, in the prophets, it is said that they shall all be taught of God. So God have his um, instructors who teach him, and the, the, the student or the people who are listening, they have to allow their minds to become in tune with what is being said. Then it said, every man therefore that had heard. So you, you, you know, to hear, you have to be listening. So that, that's another um, part or action on the part of the individual. He said the person who, um, who has been taught, who um, allowed their intellect to... Um, to be connected to what the, the, the teacher is saying, and they heard, uh, as I say, that's another action, had learned. In other words, you take it in. You, you grab a hold of it. That's action on your behalf. You grab a hold of it. You know, you hear the word preach. You hear the word teach. You give your attention to it. You know, you allow your intellect to grab a hold of it. You, you know, you meditate on it. You digest it. And it uh, uh, caused conviction to come into your heart. And uh, Jesus said, then, when all of those steps have been taken, you already um, been taught, and uh, you, know, you, you learn, you heard, and you learn of the Father, then the decision is made to come to Him. So I, I, I think this really um, shows here in verse 45 that there is um, action that is required on the part of the individual. And even though Jesus said that the Father will draw um, those who he, who he wants to come to Him, it is not totally on God's part that He will just draw um, individual without the individual have any part or any role to play in it. The individual who has been drawn by God have a part to play in it, in the sense that they, they have to listen and they have to give consent. And then they make that decision to come to know Him as their Lord and Savior. Praise the Lord. Verse um, 46. He said, Not that any man had seen the Father, save he which is of God. He had seen the Father. So here Jesus is telling them again that no man had seen the Father, save him that is of God. And that, as I said here, we are not talking about um, physically, and uh, I believe he's talking about when a person has a relationship, when you commune with God, you know, you get to know him on a personal basis, you get to know him through his words, praise the name of the Lord. This is what he's talking about, seeing the Father. He's not talking about having a, a physical um, picture of him or seeing him um, physically. He's talking about getting to know him in, in a personal sense, through his words, where you can... 
uh, develop a relationship with him. Verse 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believed on me had everlasting life. And this is not just ordinary belief. You know, a lot of people say, Well, I believe in Jesus. Just believing in Jesus alone is not going to give you everlasting life. You have to make um, other steps. You have to acknowledge your sins. You can't just say, well, I believe that I believe Jesus exists. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that will make you a born-again believer. You have to, even though you believe that Jesus exists, you still have to acknowledge that you are a sinner in the sight of God. And after you acknowledge that you are a sinner in God's sight, you confess your sins. And you ask Him to forgive you of your sins. You must ask for forgiveness. Because unconfessed sins is unforgiven sin. Praise the Lord. And uh, then when we make those um, steps, then uh, we become truly born again. And then we can say that we, are, we will be um, the, the, in, uh, the, the people who will inherit eternal life. Praise the Lord. All right, is there any um, comment or any question anybody would like to ask before we kind of wrap up for today? What I say, what I want, okay, like the people who are having problems, they don't understand the salvation. Mm-hmm. It, from the beginning, when, when, when Moses and the high priest, and they have to do so much, they also have to um, perform so much procedures for Moses to offer up um, the animals for the sins of the people. It just, it just for example, let's say this whole compound here is surrounded by King Furious's dog. Mm-hmm. Nobody can get here. I hear one person come and he remove all his dogs from the area. And then they, it, it makes the access easy for the people to come inside. Right. It's just the way they are, all the amount of problems that they have with sin and sacrifice. Here Christ come and he remove all these obstacles. Oh, yes. And he, make it, he come and he bring salvation. So all this, they don't have to go through all the things that it's, what it's for the priest to do work for them and that for them. Christ come and he give them it very easy. And he said, this is the way. And just, just by accepting him, then you have privilege to go before God as an individual and say, Lord, help me mm-hmm. to the salvation of Jesus Christ. Yes. So that's what Jesus Christ was trying to explain to them when you talk about salvation. But all these kind of different procedures they have to go through, guidelines to follow up, Christ cut it off. And he make it easy for them, free access. And that yes. was what he find again hard to understand. Well, you see, what, with the Jews, uh, the way how they was expecting their Messiah to come, he didn't really show up in that way, eh? And because of that, they didn't really receive him. Because with the Jewish people, they were expecting Elijah to physically come before Messiah return. And uh, they will, you know, cite texts in Malachi. Malachi, I think, chapter 3, talking about um, the messenger or Elijah is going to come before the day of uh, Messiah. So they were literally looking for, uh, just like how Elijah um, ascended up to heaven. They were looking for him to come down uh, before the Messiah comes. And that's the reason why um, they were asking John the Baptist if he was Elijah. Uh, they were asking him if he was Elijah. And uh, uh, he told them no. And uh, Jesus told them that, uh, in, I, I, I'm not going to quote the exact way he put it, but what Jesus was saying that um, the Elijah that was promised, he did came. And the Jewish people did not receive him. They mistreat him. Because John the Baptist, he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. You know, um, John the Baptist, he demonstrates some of the characteristics of Elijah. Elijah was a rough, rugged kind of guy. You know, he lived a lot of time out in the desert. And John the Baptist, he uh, had that same kind of lifestyle. And uh, John the Baptist had... He was um, empowered by God with the same spirit um, that Elijah had, power and spirit of Elijah. But the Jewish people did not receive him. So because they did not acknowledge um, uh, the messenger that came before the Messiah in the form of John the Baptist, they did not acknowledge him. So therefore they didn't receive the Messiah either because just like how the messenger before Messiah um, didn't come in the way that they was expecting him, it's the same way that Messiah didn't come in the way that they was expecting him either. Even up to this point, you know, the Jewish people are still looking for Elijah to come. Because they're still um, waiting for the true Messiah to come. Because the Jewish people, most of the Jewish people, they don't consider Jesus Christ to, to, to fit um, in the mold 
of being their Messiah. So they are looking for a Messiah to come. And uh, in, in, in Jewish gathering, when they have their gathering, their feast, or where they have their celebration, and even at home, they will have an empty chair that they leave vacant for when uh, uh, Elijah will come. So they're still looking for Elijah to come, and also they're still lo looking for, the, um, for Messiah to come. So they, they didn't really, uh, the, the, the Messiah, he didn't fit their, their, their mold. They were looking for him to come and fight the Roman government and restore, you know, Israel to the place during the time of King David. And that is in the future. That will come. But the, the time that they were expecting it to happen, it wasn't the right time. Praise the Lord. That's why I think it's in the book of Acts, they asked, um, the disciples asked, Jesus, will thou at this time restore uh, the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the season when, uh, you know, that is placed uh, within the Father's power. They don't, they don't know exactly when that is going to happen, but it, it's in the future. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Any other question or any other comment anybody would like to ask before we close up? Mm -hmm. I was doing some studies, Pastor, concerning um, modern day Israel. Mm -hmm. And I come up with this point where they were talking about the touching bloodlines. The touching bloodlines. The, the bloodline. Yes. Okay. And I come up with this guy, they call, which one they call the rat child. The rat child. child. Yes, the rat mm. child mm. is one of the most richest man in Israel. So today Israel has been divided into two parts. And you have a minority, very, very few, that don't support the modern Israel. Because the modern Israel don't run by God. It run by this rich guy that is part of the totten bloodline that rule Israel. But, okay, sorry. Yeah, just a big comment. Mm -hmm. And this guy now, that, that really controlling Israel, is, a, is one of this, this, this guy, this rich guy, that controls the five richest banks in America. And he, he controls half of the world wealth. This guy is based in England. Mm -hmm. And um, Wall Street, for half, of the, um, half of the wealth, 53% of the world wealth, belongs to this guy. So these people don't really um, support Israel because Israel don't function on God. You mean um, the, the rough child? The rough child, yes. Well, uh, as you rightly said, the, the rough child is a, is a family, right? It's yes. A, it's a family, it's a group of brothers. Um, some of them passed away already. Some of their children and their nephews and nieces still alive. And uh, you rightly said it's the richest family in the world. And uh, the, the, these guys are the guys that really run the government of the world. With some other families, they run uh, the government of the world. And... Uh, I don't know whether or not they have any kind of jurisdiction over Israel. I don't really know. They but do. uh, Israel, whether or not these guys have jurisdiction over them, yes or no, Israel is rebellious yeah. from way back. Yeah. And whether or not somebody, you know, you know, forcing them or pushing them, they just have this rebelliousness within them. And uh, that is not going to change until Messiah comes. Yeah, until, you know, the Antichrist is going to um, uh, come on the scene because they're waiting for somebody who is going to give them um, permission or allow them make peace so that they can rebuild the temple and temple mount. Because right now the Jewish people don't have a temple for, for many years. And anybody who can negotiate with the Palestinian and the Muslim people to allow them to rebuild the temple on temple mount. It doesn't matter who that person is. They're going to accept that person as Messiah. Whether they are Jewish or you know, non-Jewish, they will be accepted as Messiah because that is the greatest need today in, in Israel, is to get a temple to worship. Yes. No, but I, 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 don't, think, I don't think it's Barack um, uh, Obama. I don't think so. <laughs> because Obama, Obama is just he's, he's about to be, you know, go out of um, office. So the, the guy who, um, who Israel is going to accept as their Messiah, he will have control over the whole world. You know, he, except if Obama is going to come back. They, they are already planning because they talk about it. Oh, oh, Obama wants to them. It's what he says, what they say. But you, you, you see, but we, uh, although some of these things could be true, but true. we have to understand that it's, it's speculation because we don't have any concrete proof that all what they're saying about... Um, the Illuminati and all of these, um, the Freemasons and everybody that's running the world and stuff like that. 
you know, all of these things are really speculation. And we don't really have, that's the reason why we as Christians, we have to take these things with a, with a grain of salt. You know, it's good knowledge, but it's not something we should really uh, emphasize too much on, you know, because of the fact that we don't really have concrete evidence that these things are true. Because look, for instance, um, if you're really listening to what these guys are telling us, they keep saying that to become a president of, a, of the United States, you have to be of a certain bloodline. Your bloodline has to be connected back to the kings and the queens of England and all of that. And Obama, o- is, not, uh, Obama is that connected? Yes, of course. They, they, they tell you that um, Clinton is connected, Clinton. Bush is connected, and uh, they even said that um, John Kerry. John, that's the reason why they're saying that Kerry was going to be the, the, the president, because they say that he, he's connected to the bloodline. So if you have to listen to all of these things that these people are saying, you know, uh, you could really go astray. We had to take them with a grain of salt. Well, one thing I think, I, I, I um, look at some of the documentary and the same thing and thing, and, and, and you rightfully said, mm-hmm. is, is, um, is a lot of people who believe that these Jewish people are doing that. Mm-hmm. And as you rightfully said, and that is my conclusion, is a lot of speculation. Yeah. Because there is no full proof or evidence of that. But, but brother, can I look at it? Look at the whole thing. Eh? Look at the whole thing. Already go. The Bible talks about mystery, but I'm like, just a little while. And it, it based back way from Egypt. And it come back to, to the, the, look at Washington. Washington, D.C., the Buckingham Palace, and uh, um, where the Pope is, um, what do they call it again? Rome. Rome. Yeah, where the Pope is. They have this, they have this, um, this, this abolished right in, in, in all the yard. The, the abolished fighting up to the heavens. And the trip is right up to the top. But, where, 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 this thing, where this thing is true, look at the hat that the Pope wears and the hat that the, um, the first time is to wear. They look just the same. They look just the same. They're identical. Mm-hmm. So the, the, whole, the whole thing, is, the, the whole children is, is, is really true. Well, as I said, we still have to take them in a grain of salt right? because we don't really have concrete evidence. It, it's just like, you, you, remember, you remember about the Bible code? You remember with the Bible code? Remember people who just buy into the Bible code and then there is hidden message in the Bible and uh, even a lot of our top leading uh, religious leaders get into the Bible code thing and they tell you about all these hidden messages in the Bible. We, we have to be careful. I'm not saying, I'm not totally throwing out these things because what, what, what the, the elders said here about the Rothschilds, they are the richest family in the whole world. And, uh, you know, apparently they gain a lot from a lot of the wars, you know, all of these fighting that take place, all of the different world wars that take place. They are the one who finances all of the arms and the ammunition and stuff like that. So they, 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 are, they are a high-ranking world family. But, but still, with all of that, we can't just take everything people say, you know, in terms of, you know, these things. We have to, we have to be careful. Otherwise, you know, if we concentrate too much on these things, we could end up in trouble. I know there's a lot of different people who are talking about these things. I think Jesse um, where, uh, Ventura has a program that is going on right now about all these things. You know, so we, we have to be careful. It's good information to, to listen to. But tell you the truth, I, I don't really spend too much time on these things. I'm not saying that we can't listen to them and study them. But I, I more want to concentrate on what the Bible says. You know, what the scripture what says. Mm. To them too. Because where they, where they infiltrate it. Okay, right. All right. Yes, well, yeah, as I said, you know, um, we have to, you know, research and do these things, but uh, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, brother, tell us what ask God blessing as we close.